okay to continue with all the problems with premillennial dispensationalism. Uh, I thought we'd look at it a little bit, a couple of different things tonight. One is, um, I think I have to get out of the way is there is no millennium. There is a kingdom that this kingdom is here now, but maybe not here, but in heaven. And the kingdom is not literally on the earth. There is an amillennial position, probably most of them. It's probably the, the main stripe down the middle that says that the kingdom is in heaven and is now. That the kingdom is maybe more than a thousand years. Well, that Satan is now bound. And that Jesus is on his promised throne. And uh, so that's generally the most popular position. And um, the, the premillennial position is that the kingdom will be a 1,000 year period, the millennium specifically. Most premillennialists will agree that God's kingdom is eternal and will continue. What that looks like after a 1,000 years is um, there's some variation of opinion. I know I differ um, completely off the, the main path of dispensationalism where that's concerned. I will at a future date um, get more into it, um, what I'm talking about, but I kind of take a completely different position than um, mainline dispensationalists. That new heaven and new earth um, is, in my opinion, I think the strong evidence that new heaven and new earth happens or begins right at the beginning of the millennium. And it's not like a Second Peter 3 thing where everything's nuked and annihilated and completely destroyed and that um, God's going to create a new heaven and new earth. And this is all happens after Revelation 20. And even the language of Second Peter 3 is about the day of the Lord, which is the tribulation period. But as I go forth, um, let me remember to do something, take care of business that I seem to never do or rarely do. And that is to say, please subscribe to the channel. After you subscribe, look down at some of the playlists, and some of the playlists you'll see, for instance, a really long playlist of the Book of Revelation that we just finished up Sunday evenings here. And um, the go to the very last four or five episodes or sessions on the Book of Revelation, and we get into Revelation chapter 20 and 21 and 22. Let's take a quick look at this. I'm just going to go ahead and jump over here and, and do this real quick, because you don't need to be looking at my face. but um, about the millennial kingdom, it's a dispensational model, and it's different from the mainstream, and that is something I call restorationism, because I don't know what else to call them, and it's not restorationism in the sense of what the charismatic church will use it, where it has to do with um, being restored from demonic possession or control, that kind of thing, but about Christ restoring the heavens and the earth, because that's the way the term is used in the scripture, and I'm not sure which of these terms is best, so I'm a, am I a restorationist? New heaven and new earth begins at the beginning. Jesus says, behold, I'm making all things new when he comes back, right? Can we agree to that at the end of the book of Revelation that it does say that? And that if the tribulation happens the way John portrays it and we take it as literally as possible there, then we have to agree that the earth is completely trashed by that point and that we would have to have a new heaven and earth before we move down the line into some thousand year kingdom, right? I think scripture supports that, but that's for another session. I just want to real quick look at um, the millennial kingdom, what the scripture says, because um, it's important to understand that the kingdom that comes is here on the earth. Because if I can rattle your cage a little bit and disabuse you of the notion that the kingdom is happening right now and that it's in heaven, then maybe I'll get you to listen and consider some of the rest of the material that I have to show. But new heaven and new earth is the, is the same word um, the word new used in these passages is the same word that's used in, in Revelation about a new heaven and new earth. Now, were you nuked and rolled up like a scroll, recreated out of whole cloth when you became a new creation, a, a new creature, a new man? It's the same word as when he says, he sat upon the throne and says, behold, I make all things new. And there's a new heaven and new earth. It's all the same term. So that's my point I'm trying to get at is that um, there's no need for everything to be nuked again, but we'll get into Second Peter 3 at another time. I just want to tease you a little bit with that. Um, 
So moving forward in here, let's take a look at some of these verses, what the scripture actually says about the millennial kingdom, okay? Um, over the years, many have assumed annihilation of the Old Testament in favor of the new, but what might we infer from Old Testament texts? And I'm going to cover this too because it talks about more than just this restorationist idea, this notion in my head. In Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. Um, so this is where the, this is discussing the promised land, right? And then he reiterates the same promise in Genesis 1780 says, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land of your so sojournings. That means where you're walking around, the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan. So that's all the land, not just part of it. And they've never possessed all of it, frankly. Uh, I know we, this last session we talked about how they, they were in the land and the promise was fulfilled, and they did get into the land. But all the all the borders, all the boundaries, they've never been in all the land yet in all history. But that's part of the promise for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, let, let me ask you something. If if God was going to make a new heaven and a new earth and had to remove the Jews off of it and create a new earth out of whole cloth, it wouldn't be the land of their sojournings, would it? It'd be something completely new, a new paradigm entirely. That's one of the reasons why I discount the idea that Second Peter 3 is more than hyperbole, that it's just talking about the destruction that happens during the tribulation, not something that happens after the thousand-year reign of Christ. That makes no sense. John never mentioned it. It's startling that that's not even mentioned. If that's such a that would be such a big um, fireworks display, and to not even mention it is would be startling. So, okay, um, here's something to ask yourself about the kingdom: the wolf shall lay down with the lamb. So, it's the question about the the curse, right? The wolf shall lay down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lay down with the young goat. We're talking about kingdom here. And the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. This is heaven right now. Little children in heaven and these animals. The cow and the bear shall graze. The young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Really? Is there lions eating straw in heaven right now? They're nursing child. There's nursing children in heaven right now. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra, and the weaned, weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth. The earth, oh, hmm, that's awkward. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Can we say that now? If heaven's going on right now, is that what can be said now? That's in the context. The earth shall be, and he's talking about his holy mountain. He's talking about here on the earth. Let's continue. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. I'm well, talking about creation here, right? Not heaven where God dwells and has been for all eternity. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage. Oh, is that, does creation include heaven here? Was heaven ever in bondage? So that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Romans 8, 19 to 22. Let's continue, though. You can feel free to pause on these at any time. It's one of the advantages of having video, right? You can hit the pause button if you need to go and suss it out. Psalm 105, 6. O seed of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He has remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations thousand there is that literally a thousand generations well there clearly it's like he owns the cattle on a thousand hills he's probably speaking hyperbole of of uh all generations or a real long time just by virtue of the context trying to communicate the notion that um, it doesn't end okay so how do we know that that's the way to translate it and not and that it is hyperbole and not literal well let's continue reading this illustrates an example i gave last time the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac, then he confirmed to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. Okay, so we know that he's talking hyperbole here when he talks about a thousand generations. He's talking about never ending. In other words, you can't count a thousand generations. How long is that? Especially for the ancient man. He's speaking to in the Psalms here. 
try to understand that's the biggest number they had. That's like if you said billions and billions. So to them, that means everlasting. It means forever. To you, I will give the land of Canaan. Oh, the land of Canaan, is that up there in heaven? I don't think so. As the portion of your inheritance. Let's continue. Then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. New heaven and new earth? New earth all recreated on a whole cross? No. The promise is this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. So they're going to be there forever and ever. That means going a thousand years, yes, but it continues after that. Well, what terminates at the end of a thousand years? And what's at the end of that? Well, we, we, we read about the great white throne judgment. And then after that thousand years, there's no more sin and everybody has perfected bodies, glorified bodies. There's no more sin. We go into eternity future, whatever that looks like. We don't know what the future after the millennium looks like, frankly. I, I can't really find Bible verses that talk about it other than that. I hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, etc. Jeremiah 30, verse 3. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land which I gave to their forefathers, and they will possess it. Jeremiah 30, 18. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tenth of Jacob and have compassion on his dwelling places. The city will be built on its ruin and the palace will stand on its rightful place. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth with shouts of joy before you. All the trees of the field will clap their hands. Obviously, this is symbolic language here, talking about all creation moaning and groaning and travailing like a woman at birth, you know, waiting for deliverance. We read one of those verses earlier there. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up, and instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up, and it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign, which will not be destroyed. So there's no time God is ever going to destroy it. They're going to keep dwelling where they've been forever. Okay. Isaiah 27, 6 says, In the days to come, Jacob will take root, Israel will blossom and sprout, and they will fill the whole world with fruit. The wilderness and dry land shall be glad in Isaiah 35. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. Clearly, this is earth and it's not in heaven. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, rejoice with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. We continue in this chapter, look down verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break, break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. Now, this isn't a conversion of heaven. This is the conversion of earth, once again. Continuing in chapter 35 of Isaiah. Listen to this. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. Oh, there's going to be unclean there? You betcha. There's still going to be sin in the kingdom, because... Uh, who does Satan round up to rebel with him but the children of those who originally went into the kingdom, went into the millennium period? They're going to have children, and uh, not, they're not all going to be believers any more than they are all believers now, and they're going to rebel. But the unclean shall not pass over. They shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. They can't get lost on it. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Verse 10, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall take gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Ezekiel 34, 13 and 14. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. Now this started in 1948, did it not? And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. So 1948 might have been the beginning of this, where they're coming in, brought back into their own land. But this, it's uh, still continuing, and it's not the final fulfillment of that promise yet either. Ezekiel 37, 24 to 28, my servant David will be king over them, and they will 
all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob. What land did he give to Jacob? The promised land, Israel, right? Not in heaven. I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers live, just to clarify. And they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. Notice Ezekiel there. This is well after Joshua. Okay. My dwelling place will also be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Amos 9, 11 to 15. You getting the picture yet? In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches. Are there breaches in heaven? I don't think so. I will also raise up its ruins. Are there ruins in heaven? In heaven? I don't think so. And rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the reaper of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains will drip sweet wine, and all the hills will be dissolved, and I will restore the captivity of my people, Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. And uh, I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from the land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. So, they're away from the land, they're gathered back, they won't again be rooted out, not even for a new heaven and new earth. Isaiah 9, 7, there will be no end to the increase of his government of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. This is what we read in the uh, beginning of Luke, right? Isn't this what Gabriel promised Mary? Jesus might be on a throne right now, sitting on the right hand of his father, but he's not in David's throne. David's throne was never in heaven. Here the promise is the government of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Micah 4, 7, I will make the lame a remnant and the outcast, outcast a strong nation and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. And the establishment of this kingdom is said to continue forever. We can only conclude that at 1,000 years will come the decision time for all the mortals followed by the great white throne judgment. Then we move on to eternity future with whatever the Lord has planned for us, including the continuation of this kingdom on earth. I'm going to stop here because that's far enough for now. I gave another bit of a teaser for the lesson we'll get into in Isaiah 65, which is really the parent chapter, parent passage for Second Peter chapter 3, just as another teaser. So, um, there you have it. Kingdoms on earth. It's going to be forever. Yes, it's going to go for a thousand years. Revelation 20 says thousand six times. Can't get around that. Sorry, folks. Bend and twist as you will, but the same folks who want to bend and twist it and make that not happen and try to make it all symbolic want you to believe that kingdom is right now in heaven. Those verses we just read, does that look like heaven to you? It'll be heaven because Christ will be dwelling with us, God with us. And wherever he dwells is heaven, but it's not up there before the throne of God happening right now. It is in your future, though, and it is forever.